Hi everyone, this is Grace and today I'm going to be walking you through this beautiful maple leaf set that I made. This video is an hour and 20 minutes long, so buckle up. I'm going to see if I have an hour and 20 minutes of things to say and if I don't, I may leave you for a moment to just enjoy the decorating and some calming music. But here we go, let's get this party started. So first up. One of my inspirations for this set was to use the Sugar Art Master Elite Fall Collection line, which includes five different colors. You've got the burgundy that I'm starting with here now, a pumpkin orange, autumn gold for the yellow, a true brown, and a blueberry blue. So those are the five colors I was using really committed <laughs> to using those colors and I I know I know using the all those colors on a maple leaf might be a little funny I mean maybe it's just the blue but I was committed to this color scheme and the concept behind this set that I do is I've done a few of these now I call them my shape series where I pick one shape and then I let my imagination run wild and I come up with at least 15 to 20 designs. I sit down and I decorate for like, it's a really long day. It's at least a 12 hour decorating day. And I just try out a bunch of different things, a bunch of different techniques, designs, and I see what sticks. There are always some duds in this set. There were a handful of duds that you'll never see. <laughs> um, but overall, I'm really happy with the designs that I came up with and in a second I'll tell you how many I actually made. But let's talk about this cookie right here before it is all done. This is one of my favorites. I'm using a thick flood for this entire set. I do everything with a one consistency outline and flood. If you're not sure what I mean by thick flood, check out my video on consistencies. And I'm doing a wet on wet here so that means I'm flooding everything right away. Um, so it's all wet next to wet. And then I'm using my scribe here to do some pulls. This is like a very standard, basic technique here. Um, something to keep in mind, I'm not cleaning off my scribe after every pull, which gives it kind of a messy look because you see that icing, other icing color in every pull, but that's fine because I wanted kind of a messy look with this. You know, it's a maple leaf. And just to just to zhuzh it up a little, I decided to add a piece of parchment paper on top. I know, parchment paper is not for everyone, but I've done this kind of design before, um, and I wanted to do something a little different. That's always my goal, is to do something different when I make a new set. So this is just a cut up piece of parchment. I will leave it there overnight. It's deceiving, this time lapse here. I left it overnight on a tray it is completely dried at this point. Now I'm using another favorite product, the Sugar Art Sterling Pearl in pure gold. This is mixed with Everclear. I use this a few different times in this set. Love a good, uh, I'm blanking. What is, <laughs> splatter, that's called a splatter. Splatter, my friends. So in all, it looks like I made 13 or 13 different designs made it to the final set. So we're going to have fun here. That was one down, 12 to go. Another one of my favorites in this set. Um, this cookie took a long time. <laughs> I think this was about a 10 minute cookie. Um, what can we talk about here? So this is an edible marker, edible marker. I will link um, an option in the description of the video. It really doesn't matter what color you're using. I would say probably just maybe don't use yellow because it's not quite dark enough. Um, it's not gonna seep through the icing, so whatever you want. I used brown because it just felt appropriate for my maple leaf set. Now, I am I'm flooding in sections here, but not what I usually mean by flooding in sections. <laughs> I, what I usually mean by flooding in sections is I let each, every other section dry. So I get definition in between the sections, but in this case, I do not want definition. I just want a beautiful, smooth end result here. 
so I'm going to be flooding each section right away so one next to the other so that it is wet next to wet and they will melt into each other beautifully using my handy dandy scribe which I will talk about in a moment okay so let's talk about what I'm doing here this is the this moment right there that is the most important part of this cookie <laughs> or of executing this um, or let's say top three uh, it's because that is the moment where I establish the seam in between the two colors it's a one and done this is your one chance to get it right cross your fingers hope you did it well I'm of the personal belief that you should not be using a scribe to mess with that seam at all. So let's watch this again. I'm doing basically an outline here. So since this is a flood consistency, it's gonna come out of my bag pretty easily. Um, so I'm probably applying minimal, if any, pressure to get just an outline consistency out. And then I'm going to flood up next to that outline next to it. It's kind of hard to see because that outline is pretty small, but I'm not messing with that seam once I flood that outline. And I try to use, I try to flood the whole section. If there's something that's truly too small to get the tip of my bag in, then I won't. And there's an area I think later that I maybe can't remember. Um, I'm using my smallest scribe here. So I always have three scribes with me when I decorate. This is my smallest one um, that's metal. This is my PME scribe, which I believe is linked in the description. Okay, here's a nice long seam. Let's watch this one again. So I'm laying it almost on top of the very edge of the previous color. So I'm laying it like a millimeter to make sure that I'm in control of that seam. And then I squeeze that bag and flood next to the seam. So something to make sure you don't do is that you can mess with that seam once you flood next to it. Because if you, if you try to <laughs> put a bit too much pressure on that flood, then it can actually mess with your seam. So just something to keep in mind. It is a thick flood, as you can see, so I do need a scribe to help it settle. And this is the kind of design where I don't want to jiggle the cookie at all because I'm flooding one section at a time. And the thing is, by the time I get to the last one, the first one has probably started to crust, especially since this is taking me a long time to flood. So the reason why it would be bad to jiggle the cookie at that point to help it settle is if you've ever had your cookies have cracks in the surface, that is because you have moved your cookie too much in the early stages of drying. And that means because when your cookie, when your icing develops a crust on the surface, like just barely develops a crust, all of the icing below it is still wet. And if you move your cookie, especially if you move it, um, if you tip it <laughs> and don't keep it flat, um, the icing underneath the crust is still gonna move, right? So it's gonna move and it's gonna push the crust, which is what creates the cracks that you may see. Um, I have a theory, I don't know if it's a theory, I have a belief with my scribes, which is why I have three different scribes when I decorate. Um, I have this really thin one for a smaller detail. Then I have that thicker metal one, which I used on the first cookie that is from Borderlands Bakery. My favorite scribe, it's her like classic scribe. I don't know if classic is the right word, but um, it has the heart on the top, which is my favorite because it it so ergonomically nicely sits on um, my knuckle. Excuse me. It is early this morning while I'm doing this voiceover. 
the hustle never ends, my friends. So I am using that scribe to help this settle, but I'm not getting anywhere near that seam. If I have to get close to it, I always leave like a couple millimeters. This is one of the cookies where I wanted to highlight the marriage of the colors. So this is all of the colors except the blue. I don't think... Yeah, I actually don't think that I made... Oh man, I don't think I made one design with all of the colors in it. There was always one color left out. Something also... So... I went against my usual rule of sticking to five to six colors and I really wanted there to be a bit more dimension to this set so instead of just doing the five master elite fall collection colors I um, did two gradations of each color <laughs> so that is oh, that was ten colors Woo. And that was two consistencies, I think, of every color. Maybe not of every color, but... No, it was, yes. It was of every color. So that's more colors than I normally like to do, but I think it was worth it. I'm just... So... This cookie is just so beautiful, and I kind of wish... As I look at it now, I'm like, why didn't I just leave it, <laughs> leave it alone? Uh, what I'm doing right here is I could tell that I over flooded already. So I use my scribe to just um, clean off the edge of the cookie. All right, I have allowed this to crust and I'm putting the finishing touch on here which is just a little bit of simple but very effective line work. This is a soft peak piping consistency. So just about all of my piping consistency in this set is a soft peak. I think I used a medium peak once that you'll see in a design later. What's difficult, among other things, about this design is that I had it all coming from one point in the corner and it can be challenging to get that clean corner because um, it can be too easy to have too much icing at the start of your line um, which can result in buildup in that corner and I really didn't want buildup so I was going for the cleanest little corner I could using that scribe a couple times just to make sure I wasn't getting too much buildup. <laughs> this, this cookie is like, it's so clean and, you know, deceptively simple, but not easy. The simplest designs are the hardest to execute because you don't have anything to hide behind. No intricate, detailing to hide behind it just it's on display so there we go that beauty this next design I know more parchment paper someone out there is rolling their eyes <laughs> I feel like the parchment paper is pretty polarizing you either love it or you hate it or you're just really confused and maybe indifferent I tend to be on the love side so I've done crumpled before and I wanted to mix it up a little I've seen other cookiers use it on just half the cookie so I felt very inspired to do that here uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute I want to take a pause for a moment on this color so this pink reminds me now the Sugar Art Master Elites are a highly pigmented powder and the coloring relies heavily on science. So, and the science behind it does not work well in a highly acidic environment. So if you've used or made my icing recipe, you know that my icing recipe uses lemon juice, which is highly acidic. This means that 
for me personally, and I do use a unique recipe. Most people don't do a lemon juice swirl icing. Most people do vanilla. Um, I There are certain master elites that I cannot use with my lemon juice recipe because they don't turn out correctly. And it's predominantly the pinks. Those are the only colors I truly cannot use um, because it just does not work with my lemon juice. The exception though, so this is a beautiful soft pink, right? But this is coming from the burgundy because I did use my lemon recipe for this set because this is my tried and true. This is my pride and joy. Um, I am able to shoot, achieve this beautiful soft pink by just not using as much of the burgundy. So I'll talk more about the Master Elites a bit later, but let's talk about this parchment here. Um, this is kind of going with one of the motifs in the set, which is this energy from the lower left to the upper right. That's how I decided to divide my maple leaf. And again, deceiving here, I let this dry overnight. And then I go to peel off the parchment and I say a prayer because <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes it doesn't dry properly and I'm pulling off like half of the icing with the parchment and then I cry a little. Actually that happened with one of the designs that didn't make it to the finals. I tried doing um, a flood that was covered in diamond dust, edible glitter, and then putting parchment on top. That did not work. Um, I think maybe the, because I used an excessive amount of diamond dust, maybe that prevented the icing from drying, I'm not really sure, but it only about half dried after being left overnight, so when I pulled off the parchment, it <laughs> pulled off the icing with it, and I was like, alright, it's not happening. Um, this is another sterling pearl, this is my first time using this color, this is their rust, and I love this, it's, it goes perfectly with the burgundy in this set and you'll see me use it again later. This is their pure gold again. Just mixing it with Everclear using my trusty fan brush. And I, I like that splatter on this cookie because I feel like it helps um, marry the two different sides of the design together. Helps bring it, bring it all together now. Now, this next design here is one of the designs, well, I mean, this happens every set, I was gonna say in this set, um, but is this did not turn out exactly as I had planned, and that's okay. So one of the beautiful things about this shape series set that I do is that I give myself permission to fail. And that's very liberating as an artist to give yourself permission to fail because it means I can try things out and it's okay if they don't all work. Now, obviously I'm not selling these cookies. So if I was making a set to sell, like I was doing a custom order, maybe this <laughs> approach wouldn't work so well. But in this case, it does work. Um, and I always design like I attempt to execute 15 to 20 designs because by the end of it, I would like at minimum 12. You've seen some other sets I've had up to upwards of 17. I had a few fails in this one. Um, but more often what happens than a fail is just a roll with the punches. So this one, I had to pivot a little bit from my intended design, just like I did with the the gold one, <clears throat> the flooded in sections gold one you saw earlier. So for this, I'm rocking this wet on wet. This is another motif in this set that you'll see again, I think one more time. I had I had done this a third time in another fail <laughs> that you won't see. Um, I do think it's really important with this set with so many different designs that there be a couple of motifs that are carried throughout the set so that there's a bit of cohesion. Um, so I'd say two of the motifs that I have 
is this specific design, this kind of line work in this orientation, and then this energy from the lower left to the lower right. So there are quite a few designs that I'm doing where the direction is from lower left to upper right. Just using my scribe here to jiggle the surface of that icing to help it settle. <laughs> because I am using a thicker flood. So by the time I got to those last lines, um, my darker orange had started to crest a bit. So this is the part of the design that I hadn't planned. I had originally thought that I would do line work on top of the lighter orange with the lighter orange piping. And I tried that and realized that the lines that I had flooded with the lighter orange weren't thick enough because when I put the piping on top, it just looked like it, it didn't it didn't look any different. If that makes sense. Like I was trying to go for a 3D look um, and it just just didn't work. So I stared at it and I was like, I had two of these cookies in front of me trying to figure out, OK, so that didn't work, but I feel like it needs something. Um, so I decided to do the opposite and I am piping the dark orange on top of the dark orange. Now I, if I'm going to be critical of myself here and the execution of this design and what I could improve next time, the hardest part by far is the flooding the lines because you're using a flood consistency. I had a flood tip size, so it's a pretty big tip. Um, flood comes out of that bag real fast. It's very hard to control lines. So you can see the starts and the ends of my lines are not that clean. Like many of them have um, some kind of like accumulation at the beginning. Um, it's hard to say how I could actually improve that. Um, I suppose one way is I could cut a smaller tip in my bag. It would then result in a smaller line. Um, but if I had ultimate patience, I could flood two lines next to each other. That all just sounds like something I, <laughs> I don't have the patience for. So maybe that's not a good solution. But just something to keep in mind. If that kind of drives you crazy, the, <laughs> the not so perfect flooded parts, then maybe this design is not for you and that's okay. So here we go. Isn't she gorgeous? Next up a we have the first use of the blueberry. Pardon me while I take a sip of my coffee. All right, the blueberry. So <laughs> back to the topic of Master Leeds and lemon juice. Um, this is one color where my version with the lemon juice icing is slightly, slightly different than intended. The original or the, the true blueberry has a bit more red in it than this does, I'm told. Um, from the owners of the sugar art in explaining why mine is more blue is that the lemon juice is breaking down the red in the color. So that's why and it, and it just leaves the blue behind if that makes sense. I personally love this blue. Um, but if you if you use a non lemon juice recipe to make this, just keep in mind that your blue may be, it's not purple, but it just, it just has a little more red in it than this blue does. And you can see that striation there. If you can see that in the flood, that's because my icing had started to separate, which is totally natural for royal icing over time. It will separate you can so and if you can see that in the flood especially in the light um but that happens from separation um the the liquid separates from the sugar and it, it always happens to me because 
I have very long decorating days. They're usually like, I'm really happy if it's a 10 hour day. <laughs> um, by the end of my days, I always have separation. So, and I, I never, these days, I rarely, rarely, rarely ever remix a bag. It has to be really bad separation. I usually just try to massage it out in the bag. It's usually good enough. I knew I was going to be covering this with a bunch of um, piping, so I wasn't that concerned about it showing up too much. So speaking of piping, let's talk about my piping. I'm using Soft Peak for this line work. And yes, I'm freehanding this, but honestly, I'd, if I didn't freehand this, I'm not really sure what I would do instead. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could use an edible marker to sketch this out first with a ruler, but you would need to make sure you're using a pretty thin line of a marker and certainly a thicker line than I'm piping right now because that that piped icing needs to cover the edible marker line. I could have done a little better <laughs> with my freehanded piping. Like right here you can see that middle section, whoopsies, is not um is not even. Yeah. Oh well. I made two of most of these designs, so <laughs> what usually happens is I make one um, to practice and then the second one I film. So I've got one shot to film and that's it. Uh, what I'm doing here is called the cable knit technique and I think this might be the first time I've ever done cable knit, which amazes me. I'm obsessed with doing a sweater knit, which you'll see later, and this is just kind of a, a sister to that. I'm using medium peak, or in this case, my end of day medium peak, uh, <laughs> which means it's a little softer than a true medium. And I've got a pretty big tip on my bag here. Like this is even thicker than a flood tip. And what I'm doing is creating an S curve. And you need to tuck the beginning of the S curve into the previous one and cover the end of the previous one at the same time. So do that S, or in this case, okay, so I start out with a C, and then I do an elongated S. So tuck that beginning into the previous one and then cover the end of the previous one. I just find this very satisfying to do. I almost, I wish that I had done an entire cookie with the cable knit. I don't know why I abandoned ship on that. Because it's just, I don't know. I think it's so fun to do. And it, I don't, maybe it's faster than I think it is. Because um, it covers a pretty big space. I didn't use medium peak for anything else in this set, just this one. And there we go. Ooh, how satisfying is that? Mm, so satisfying. All right, what do we have up next? Oh, I think I know, okay. This is another one. Um. This is another, I suppose, you know, motif you could say. So you, we saw this in the second cookie I did. This kind of prism section from the lower left. The first one I made eight sections. For this one, I'm making six, just to mix it up a little. This is another design where I wanted to um, 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 
<laughs> I wanted to incorporate more colors together. So this I use the blueberry, I believe I use the blueberry, the pumpkin, and the autumn gold. And if you want to do that second design that I showed, you could do that with fewer sections like this one. You could even do it with like three sections instead of six. It's just the idea here. And you can see that I flood all the way up to the edge with a one consistency outline and flood. That's because I'm comfortable doing that. If you're not, you may want to leave a millimeter or two and use your scribe to encourage that, I think, to the end. Whenever I'm doing a one consistency, or really any, even if I'm doing a two consistency, I always want to use <clears throat> a scribe on any sharp corners like there are here because I just have a hard time achieving a crisp sharp corner with the icing bag alone so I will use my scribe to assist Ooh, this orange reminds me I want to talk about how I mix my colors so if you've made or seen the sugar art fall collection you may notice a difference in my orange versus the orange that's in the original mix. And it's nothing to do with, um, or at least I don't think it's anything to do <laughs> with it being lemon. Um, it is how I mix my icing. So I've always done this and I always do this no matter what colors I'm working with. I always mix a little bit of each color into each other before I finish mixing. So what that means is I have, you know, in this case, I had five bowls of the main saturated colors and I mixed probably like a dime size amount. I added a dime size amount of each color to each bowl so that when you mix them together, it just kind of gives all of the colors the same undertones, I believe is the right word. It makes them feel like they're all from the same color family. I don't know if I'm using that right word. My mother is a painter. I should really know these words better. Um, but the point here being that doing that resulted in a much more muted orange then the original set, the original set has a, has a brighter orange with it. And I just think a lot of people have said that this set gives them major 70s vibes and I am so there for it. That's actually, that was actually my goal um, in especially wanting a more muted orange. I love the orange, the yellow, the brown in this set. Such 70s vibes. I am so here for it. So the only color I don't do that mixing technique with obviously is white. <laughs> um, white, I do use a little bit of white food coloring to color my white. I didn't use white in this set, but just a side note. I either use the Americ, no is it Chef Master? Chef Master or Americolor white gel, or I'll use the Sugar Art Masterly in white. So. This technique that I'm about to do, um, I call the crackle technique. And the number one question I always get asked is, how long do you wait before you do the crackle? And it's really, <laughs> it's hard to give an answer because even for me, it changes. It depends, um, it all depends on how fast your icing is drying. And that depends on how you dry your icing, if you're using a dehydrator or a table fan or nothing. Um, it depends on how the temperature of your room, is it hot, is it cold, is it humid, is it dry? Um, you know, the, the more 
dry, the colder the room is, the faster the icing will dry. Um, right here I'm just putting some diamond dust, sugar art diamond dust in 10k gold, just for a little extra sparkle. Um, so for me, I dry my cookies for the first initial like 30 minutes in a dehydrator and I always set my timer for 10 minutes and I check to see if it is dry enough. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And if it's not, I set a timer for five minutes and I check for each additional five minutes. I think this one was more like 15 minutes. You also need to know what kind of, um, kind of crackle effect you want. The drier the icing, the more it's going to look like cracks in the surface. That means because it has crusted more, so you're truly like cracking the crusted surface. If you don't wait as long, if it is not as dry, it'll be more like indentations. So I would say that th this was somewhere between like a crack and an indentation. The, the indentation is going to be just a softer point. I'm using a fondant tool here but you can absolutely just use the end of a paintbrush. I just wanted an extra big kind of indentation, which I can get from that bigger fondant tool. All right, this next cookie, I'm having a blank on what this one is. How do, how do I not? <laughs> See how long it takes me to figure this out. Oh, heavens to Betsy, of course. Okay, this one. This is another 10 minute cookie. Uh, sometimes I just shake my head at myself. All right, um, what can I talk about here? Okay, so we are marking out the sections first with an edible marker. I do wish that I had um, <laughs> that I had measured out how big the sections could be because as you can see here, I did not and the sections are uneven. Alas, I will live, but I will live with uneven sections. So I am using a soft peak piping consistency here to outline this cookie and I'm going to also use it to outline the sections. I am using a thick flood so I'm not doing the outline because I need to keep the icing in. I'm doing it so that I can achieve the most perfect sections possible. And Yes, okay. <laughs> um, I'm doing very precise sections here, which is why I'm using, I'm, I'm going above and beyond here, people. I am not only tracing the sections, but then I'm outlining them. And I'm doing here the basic technique of flooding in sections, the traditional way I mean of flooding in sections, which means I'm going to flood alternate sections so that I can have um, a seam, like a separation in between the different sections. Because if I didn't do alternate sections, this would just all flood into one, uh, one yellow mess and then it would all look the same and it would be pointless as to why <laughs> I flooded alternate sections. Okay, uh, I'm doing here this famous squiggle technique. This is to help prevent craters. I personally do not think that this always works and I don't think it totally worked with this set, um, but these small sections are bound to crater and I was determined to make this crater as much as, as little as possible. So um, cratering happens when the icing dries and it has kind of a dimple in the surface of the icing and it can be anywhere from just like a small dimple to an actual crack in the surface. Totally natural, normal for royal icing 
and it just looks more pronounced in a smaller space. So the idea behind the squiggle is that it provides some extra support, like it's an extra foundation to the center of the icing. I prefer to flood on top of a still wet squiggle because I feel like it just, if the icing can dry together, then it it just like marries together better as opposed to flooding on top of dry icing. So it's like two separate entities, if this is making sense at all. Um, the other thing that I do, there are two other things that I do to prevent craters. I always pop the cookie directly into the dehydrator for at least 15 minutes after I've flooded something that's probably going to, cr or probably going to crater. But what I think is most more important in preventing craters is to just use the thickest icing consistency possible. So in this case, even with doing the dehydrator and using the squiggles, I still was left with a bit of cratering, which drove me crazy. And you'll see how I pivot at the end of this design. And I'm not really sure why I still had a tiny bit of cratering because I am using a thicker flood here. I mean, sure, I could have used an even thicker flood, but like this is a thick flood, so it should have been okay. So <sighs> yeah, um, the tried and true way I know to not get craters is to use soft peak piping consistency but I felt like these sections were a bit too big to use that. So you can see, okay, they're not cratered per se, but in my opinion, they could be puffier. Maybe I could have used even more icing. That's another thing is you need to make sure you have like plenty of icing in your section, like just, just before over flooding it. And that can be a hard balance to achieve. <laughs> Something else that's challenging in this design is getting that seam just right. So we talked about seams in the second cookie, but those were like um, seamless seams, <laughs> if that makes sense. Those were smooth seams. These seams are meant to have definition in between the two of them, but the way that you execute them is exactly the same. So this is kind of a hard section to start with talking about that because these tiny little sections are their own little unique beasts. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean by the seam in a second. And here I do have to use my scribe a bit more than I would like just to get to all of these tiny little crevices because I couldn't get to them with my scribe. I mean, sorry, I couldn't get to them with the tip of my bag. <laughs> We're almost there. All right, so there are two different ways you can do these seams. Like this here, I'm flooding up right against the seam. So this you need to be really confident in your ability to flood straight. Another way is like we did on that second cookie is to do an outline first as the seam and then flood up against it. My terminology might be a bit confusing here because I am using a flood consistency this entire time. It's just the way that I'm piping the flood consistency. So you can, you can pipe an outline with a flood and you can also pipe a flood and that if that makes sense and it all just the difference is just in the amount of pressure on your bag so the flood that I'm doing right now requires a lot of pressure an outline not as much pressure it is harder to flood on top of these squiggles if you make them too big especially it's harder to so just something to keep in mind
And now at the end of this design, after I saw it dried, the sections I'm doing right now just had like the tiniest bit of crater on them, which made my heart sad. So I added one additional element to this design, which you will see in a momento once I'm done flooding these sections here. Alrighty, so the cookie is dry and you can see, especially in these first couple sections, just like the tiniest bit of crater, which made me mad. So I decided to finish off this design with a little extra something, which is to add these piped lines every other section. And to me, what this does is it just distracts the eye from focusing solely on the sections um, because the you know the simpler the design as I've talked about the harder it is to execute because you don't have as many things distracting your eye so this is a great technique that I've done many times on something that has cratered that I didn't want to just put a line through it <laughs> I mean you can't do it through everything but leaves especially I've had leaves crater and I just like put a line through the middle of it and you just it it distracts from any sort of crater and luckily the crater is usually in the middle of the section so if you're adding a little additional line in the middle it's just right through the crater and I actually I have to say I like the addition of the lines that wasn't my plan for that design but I think it adds adds something beautiful extra so this next cookie here, I am doing folded parchment paper. I know, I'm bringing back the parchment paper. This one, it's really important to fold as small as possible. And you want it in a V shape, so you can see. So I'm not folding it like rectangles, like these are V shapes. And I'm going to leave you here with my folding and I will come back when I'm ready to ice the cookie. Alrighty, I'm now to the end of my parchment paper and there we go. There's my beautiful V shape. And now I'm going to get to icing the cookie. So I am marking off my sections. This one, I think less important to make sure that they're perfectly even because of all the things I'm going to do to the cookie or to the icing. Um, just distracts it so you could painstakingly measure these out but you really don't have to um this was another design where i wanted to incorporate 
colors, as many colors. So this one I used three. I used the true brown, the pumpkin, and the uh, gold. Summer, autumn gold, autumn gold. Wow, I just had a brain fart. Um, so this is another flooding in, <laughs> kind of come up with another way to word this because I'm flooding in sections, but not what I mean by flooding in sections. Like, uh, this is just like the second cookie where we are flooding wet next to wet. And I'm employing all the same techniques here as I've done before. So I think I will leave you here with the flooding and I'll be back when I'm ready to apply the parchment. Alrighty, can we just take a moment to appreciate how gorgeous this icing is? I kind of wish I had left it alone, but here we are. So I am carefully placing my parchment on top. And I, there are a couple of ways to do this kind of parchment technique. You can just kind of lay the creases into the icing um, and that will give you one effect. This here, I'm really trying to get the icing into all of the creases like into all of the parchment paper so i'm really creating like distinct mountains if that makes sense as opposed to like indentations in the icing from the crease from the, the corners this can be a bit harder to do and i think i was a little overly aggressive in um in how much i pressed down 
my parchment here, which I'm going to find out when I peel the parchment off. Again, this has dried overnight. So what I like about this is that it really creates this fan fold effect. I can tell I pressed too far because you can see in the in the crease corners on the bottom um, you can see the cookie kind of peeking through and I was like oh darn so to mask that because I'm a queen of masking mistakes <laughs> I decided to add some gold to those creases so you can't even tell my friends um, big fan <laughs> Now, this is the Sterling Pearl again in pure gold mixed with Everclear from the Sugar Art. And I have to admit, so that line that I just did was messier than I had hoped for. So I was rolling with the punches here and I was like, all right, so I've now committed to a messier look. So how do I, how do I see this messier look through? So I ultimately decided, after I did these lines, to also add a splatter. And y'all know how much I love a good splatter. Um, the splatter really just brings it all together, I think. And I know, I know, the look of this cookie is not for everyone. That's okay, you don't need to do it. <laughs> You could just do the flooding that I did and leave it as is. Or maybe add, you know, do the flooding, don't you do the parchment paper, and then add the splatter after. To each their own. Alright, this next design is a pretty simple one. But I really liked it. Um, I have to say, just a side note, because I've seen it a couple of people make comments that they wished there was more burgundy in the set. Ugh. So there was. Um, I had this beautiful burgundy design. That was my biggest, saddest fail of them all. <sighs> it used the darker burgundy from the set. And it was this etching technique that I've done before where you allow the icing to completely dry and then use a scribe to actually etch out the surface of the icing and what I have yet to figure out is that it looks great when right after I've etched it but then sometimes after it sits overnight because like the etches are kind of white but when it sits overnight that whiteness disappears and then you like can't see the etching anymore and it just looks like you messed up your cookie I don't know I tried to add some white powder to it like I've done before like to add white powder into the, the etches but it it just made it worse so I ultimately decided to bag that cookie so sad so sad let's talk about this one though so this is medium peak or sorry soft peak and I'm using this paintbrush that I've used a couple times um, and I'm just dragging the big dot that I'm doing. So I'm, this is not a terribly large tip. This is just my normal line tip, but I'm just applying a lot of pressure and getting a nice big dot out of it. And I wanted, I wanted there to be texture here. So I'm not trying to do perfectly smooth paint strokes. I probably could have stopped there <laughs> or stopped earlier, but I was really committed to having as many colors as I could on this one. So this obviously kind of deters from my lower left to upper right energy. This is going upper left to lower right. I didn't think it would look right coming from the lower left, so I'm feeling good about this one. 
then I allow that to dry and I'm just using that pure gold again with a brush on top. Kind of wish I had used a little less, but it's still pretty. Okay, this is another crackle technique cookie that I'm going to be doing here. Just doing my standard outline and flood. And again, I will do the same, um, set my timer for 10 minutes, check after every five. So I'm gonna see you back when I'm ready to do the crackle. Alrighty, we are ready to crack. <laughs> I just crack myself up, pun intended. Okay, I'm using that fondant tool again. I'm using the other side of it, which has a smaller ball on the end of it. Um, but for the longest time, I just use the end of a paintbrush. Um, make sure it's a rounded end of a paintbrush, not a flat one. You don't need a fondant tool for this, but I've enjoyed using the fondant tool because it's a rounder crack and also I have bigger variation in size. I like to have the smaller and the bigger so I've allowed that to dry and I'm doing my splatter. Here's another motif that carries through the set. I do the splatter on a few different cookies. This is the pure gold and then I'm going to add another sterling pearl color. This is their bronze. So in total in the set I use the pure gold this bronze and this rust. So the bronze is like a brown, the rust is more like a reddish hue. So, ah, I love that. All right, this is a very different cookie from any of the other ones. Um, this, is, this is a one-stop shop kind of design, which I love. I love designs that you can do in one fell swoop and be done and happy and this is one of them so this first bit I do kind of wish that I had used more dark brown and less of the light brown because I really did want there to be like a distinct difference um, and a nice kind of variation in color but I realized as I was starting to paint them together that they were just kind of mixing <laughs> too much and I didn't quite get the distinct color I was hoping for but oh well. Um, so what I love about this, alright I'm using that same paintbrush to just paint this icing on the surface. I'm using a soft peak but you could certainly use a medium peak too, that's totally fine. And I'm going to do my next step right on top of this. So I love this technique because 
It gives you the essence, basically, of flooding the surface of the cookie. Like, I'm covering the whole surface of the cookie with icing, but it takes a fraction of the time, and you can do the next part of your design, depending on what it is, directly on top of it. And that was my goal here, was to just do a really fast design. And you can leave as much or as little texture as you want. I wanted something in between because I was going to be doing a lot of piping on top of this, so I didn't want there to be too much icing sticking up. Off screen there, I just cleaned off my brush, so I will dip it in water to clean it off and then um, pat it on a paper towel because I don't want it to be wet. Damp is okay, but not wet. So now this cookie is going to have the sweater technique, which is a kind of pressure piping. Whoops, I messed up the end of that line. So I'm just going to fix it. So, okay. I am using, it's deceiving here, but I'm using the exact same bag, same consistency of icing. Oh wait, no. I lied. Wait, is this the same consistency? Oh no, this is more like a medium peak. Right. Forgot that. Okay, this is the other medium peak that I use because for this kind of technique, you do need more like a medium peak. If you, if you use a soft peak, it may be too soft to hold the shape here. And what I'm doing is if you've ever seen like a pressure piped heart, this is just essentially a pressure piped heart over and over again. You pipe a dot and then you pull away from the dot and while you're pulling away from the dot, you release pressure at the same time. So I'm constantly adjusting my pressure, like more pressure release, pressure release, pressure release, pressure release, pressure release, <laughs> pressure release, <laughs> so that I'm like, I'm coming down and kind of touching the surface of the cookie at the end of every stroke, if that makes sense. A lot of people refer to this as the sweater technique, at least I do, like the knit technique. It's used a lot for sweaters, that kind of look. So you can see probably why I call this kind of a sister technique to the cable knit. And I think I'll leave you here and I'll come back when this cookie is done. Alrighty, and there she is. What a beauty. We are moving on to another cookie. And this one is near and dear to my heart. I'm sitting here wondering, do I have things to talk about until I get ready to do my piping? I don't think I do. So I'm going to leave you with this beautiful yellow outline and flood and I'll be back when I'm ready to pipe my details.
Alrighty friends, I am back and we are ready to do the detail piping. So this is a continuation of one of those motifs um, that I've talked about. The same kind of line pattern. And this is the ultimate lesson in line work, or at least test in line work, I should say. So lots of things going on here. Um, I prefer a soft peak to do line work, first of all. I just think the lines lay better. It's just a bit easier to work with. I have a pretty small tip in my bag. Um, I didn't like the beginnings of those lines, so I'm just using my scribe to kind of clean them off. This is a real test in piping straight lines, in piping clean lines, in piping clean starts and finishes. Oi, oi, oi. Um, some tips I have to piping straight lines, and I will admit that I'm naturally good at them, so I struggle with tips, <laughs> um, but this is what I've got. So first up, you need to have your arm braced on the table somewhere. I, either your elbow on the table or just above your elbow on the edge of the table, make sure that you have a full 180 degree radius once your arm is placed so that you have full range of motion to pipe. Um, you need to lift the cookie or sorry, the icing off the surface of the cookie. So depending on what you're piping, how long of a line you're piping, the thickness of your icing, the size of the tip of your bag, it can be anywhere from a quarter of an inch to an inch. It's hard to tell at this angle, but I am actually pulling the icing off the surface of the cookie. In this case, these are pretty short lines, so I would say it's probably like a quarter of an inch at most. Um, it's also important to figure out what angle you pipe best from. So obviously I'm right-handed, so first of all, I pipe best from left to right. In terms of up and down, sometimes I prefer to start from the top. Sometimes I prefer to start from the bottom. It just depends. Um, this one, <laughs> I really pushed myself to leave the cookie alone. Like I didn't want to move the cookie really just for filming purposes. Um, I could have put this on a cookie swivel and moved the cookie every time I piped a new section because, you know, do yourself a favor and make sure that you're piping at the most convenient angle for you. You know, I think as you get to be a stronger piper, um, you can pipe at more and more varying angles, but especially when you're beginning, like there's going to be a comfort zone of what angle you are most comfortable piping at and just do yourself a favor. If you don't have a cookie swivel, be careful moving your cookie though, because you may catch the edge of the icing on your finger, just something to keep in mind. Um, I would say an unexpected challenge with this, executing this design, was that, um, well, first of all, I didn't, I kind of planned out the lines I wanted to do, but I was, uh, after every section I piped, <laughs> I, decided where the next one was going to go. But anyway, to the point, um, what I found challenging was that these lines were crusting as I was piping. I mean, like the previous sets. So piping up against a crusted line, if I was too kind of aggressive with the start of my line, I would actually crack the crust on a previous line, which did not look good. No ma'am, no sir. No, nobody. Um, just know. So that was just something hard to keep in mind. I think that's all I have to say on line work. So I'm going to leave you here and I'll come back when this cookie is done.
there we have it, my friends. Oh, <laughs> what a beauty. What a beauty. And we are at our very last cookie in the set. Oh, what a, what a set, what a time. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this design. This is by far the simplest of the whole set. I do always try to do one very simple design in each of these, and at least not always. <laughs> As of late, I try to do one very simple design in these shape series sets. Um, I'm always a firm believer in any set that you always have at least one really simple design. I think it First of all, it just makes your life easier to have at least one design that's really simple and fast. And second of all, I think visually it's a good balance um, in terms of how I execute my shape series. It just gives me, <laughs> um, it gives me a little break. So I always do the complicated ones first and then what it, basically whatever I have, I have left of cookies is what I do the simple design in. And this one is no different. Um, I did this design. I'm only showing you one here in this one burgundy color, but I did this in all five of the um, in all five of the colors from this set. And it's just a basic flood in the darker hue. And then I took the lighter hue in the soft peak, and I did cut I think a bit of a thicker tip on the bag. Um, and I'm just applying the icing, and then using my brush. To just brush the, a little uh, brush embroidery technique here and I'm carrying in one of the motifs of that energy from the lower left to the upper right this is really just really fast simple technique I wanted there to be texture and kind of an uneven um, painting and then I let that dry and then I put a sterling pearl on top that matched it. So this one is the rust, which just, I think, matches this so perfectly. And that's it. Um, I did this four other times in four other colors. You can see it. There was a blue in that picture right there. Um, I loved it. I love this set. This, this one is... I feel like every set, not every set, but <laughs> this is one of my favorites. I really had a lot of fun doing this. It's an ode to my roots, born and raised Vermonter. Gotta love maple syrup. I hope you like this, and I hope you try something. Have a sweet one, y'all.